Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. We've gotten a lot of requests for this topic, and it's something that uh, does come up in uh, analysis. And so we wanted to talk today about what it's like when you fall in love with your analyst. So this uh, feels like a particularly touchy subject because it is so charged when it happens in the healing environment and needs to be handled with a tremendous amount of delicacy and sensitivity. I think to fall in love in any environment is to, to dissolve, at least on a feeling level, certain boundaries and to allow certain unconscious dynamics and certain elements to emerge in the environment that are highly charged. I would like to also broaden this topic of love beyond a kind of romantic, kind of erotic love to fellow feeling love or a parental love that um, this person feels like the mother I never had or or the father I never had. There are lots of shades of love, in other words. Yes, and and there's a particular word, there's a jargon word for this, it's called transference. Transference. And I think what we're all talking about is that when you're involved in a deep process with someone, really strong feelings can get constellated. And not only that, I would say they have to get constellated. There has to be some kind of love in the room, or the analysis will not have the energy and the eros, to use the Jungian word for love, the eros that the process needs. So it's um, it's not as if it's unusual or even weird, and sometimes the feelings can be very intense and uncomfortable for the person and for the analyst as well. So, so let's talk about this landed in the consulting room. So here we are as analysts, we're sitting... Uh, on the other side of the room, in our chairs, the clients across the room. Perhaps we've been talking for several weeks or even several months on a very deep level. Our analysands often reveal secrets and profoundly deep images and dreams. That's so Uh, intimate, isn't it? Yeah, very, very intimate. And at a certain point, it's not uncommon at all that that ardorous feelings happen, which I think in part are an idealization of the analyst, which makes the analyst seem suddenly substantially more attractive, and also a fantasy that the analyst can receive anything from us, which is incredibly exciting. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to share a personal story that happened for me many, many years ago. Uh, where I I was working with someone who had had a lot of trauma in his life, and we had been working together for a long time. And he, this this person's life was fairly proscribed. His symptoms were such that he wasn't usually able to tolerate riding on public transportation, and you know our work was occurring in a large city, so that was pretty limiting. You know his life was limited in a lot of ways. And anyway, one day he came in and uh, he quite took me by surprise because he started describing the nature of his feelings for me, which were intensely romantic. And it was, it was such an incredible experience in some way because he knew he was a, he was a very psychologically sophisticated person. And he knew that these feelings, though real, though very real, were not, uh, he wasn't asking to have them acted, lived out in the world, you know? So in that frame, in that very special frame, he was able to share all of these thoughts and feelings and fantasies with me that were, you know, deeply intimate. 
And, uh, you know, I, I received them in the spirit in which they were shared. And he left my office that day and was able to ride the subway. And uh, it was, it was, you know, something kind of divine got constellated in our work together and was projected on me, and it was healing for him. That's a very moving story that his love needed to be received. And it seems to me that that's where most of us as humans are wounded, is that our love, we're wounded in that area not only not having felt loved, but not having our love be received. And what was the famous case that Freud had, or Breuer, Freud's mentor, uh, who where they started the, the quote, talking cure, uh, the precursor to psychoanalysis, and the patient fell in love with Breuer, who fled that there is something about love almost more than uh, lots of other feelings, anxiety, irritation, anger, resentment. There's something about receiving love that makes it hard. Will my love be acceptable to you, uh, the analyst? And I'm paying very close attention, Lisa, to what how you said you could receive it uh, in the spirit in which it was offered and shared uh, without either one of you enacting it, but just to be able to hold that feeling that he could say and he could speak his inner self. Yeah, I'd like to, to just think back to this idea of the process of falling in love with one's analyst and uh, unpack that a a little bit at a time. My mind drifts to Jung's alchemical images from the Rosarium. And this was uh, uh, in the psychology of the transference. Jung unpacked this in, in great detail. But these are a series of images where there is a figure of a king and a figure of a queen, and uh, the way in which they meet and blend and go through these extraordinary mythic experiences, and then finally emerge as a blending of the two images, this divine hermaphrodite, often a kind of angelic figure with the head of the king and the head of the queen. And in the beginning of the process, the king and the queen draw close to each other, and they shake left hands. And so this is a phrase, a kind of juicy phrase that comes up in in Jungian work, the idea of the left handshake. And this can take uh, sometimes weeks and sometimes months in a new analysis, waiting for the unconscious mind of the analysand and the unconscious mind of the analyst to reach out and join hands with each other and to make a kind of pact that something is going to begin cooking, begin exchanging at that unconscious to unconscious level, which is going to start to bring forward the unpredictable process of transformation. Yeah, that's that's a great way to enter that, Joseph. And I, I believe that those Rosarium images are actually on the web, so maybe we can put those in the show notes you know, it's, I think it's also in that same essay that Jung talks about the marriage quaternio, which we've discussed on a previous podcast. If you sort of imagine um, a rectangle with uh, diagonal lines going from corner to corner in both directions, there's, there's the way that our, you know, our consciousness uh, engages with the consciousness of an other And then we also are connected perhaps from our consciousness to the unconscious of the other. And hopefully we have a connection with our own unconscious. But the thing that feels really magical is when our unconscious is connected mysteriously with the unconscious of the other. And, you know, sometimes this happens in analysis. Sometimes it it doesn't really cook at that level, but but often it does. And when that happens really intensely, there there can develop a real in love feeling. It's where you mysteriously feel like you can sort of finish the other person's sentences. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I like to think of that as, um, you know, kind of reminiscent of early childhood experiences and infancy. Often, you know, mothers, if they're relatively well attuned to the baby, can just tell from a little noise, say, when the baby starts to fuss, oh, she's hungry. You know, mothers just sort of develop a good intuition about what the baby needs when, because there's just such a, they're so highly attuned. And so when we're an infant, it's this almost magical sense that when, almost before we know we have a need, it's being met. And that's such a a warm, delicious feeling. And in a relationship where there's that kind of left-hand contact, that unconscious to unconscious connection, we sometimes feel that way. If we didn't get it in early childhood, we often really yearn for it in adulthood. And when we find it, say, in the analytic container, it feels very healing and, and very magical and can generate, you know, enormous feelings. And feelings that are necessary to fuel the process of transformation, that at some point, uh, passionate feelings have to arise. And hopefully, both the client and the analyst can stay in the heat of that and hold it in the frame of transformation. Now, when I think about the the left handshake in the beginning of the work, I'm often um, looking for certain signals that the left handshake has occurred, which uh, sometimes can have to do with synchronicities begin to increase. Sometimes there's a a signal in the client's dreams that a certain kind of um, alchemical or archetypal dynamic has begun to emerge. Sometimes I'll feel the left handshake has begun because of this very intense mirroring that happens in the session. For instance, sometimes after a couple of weeks of analysis, I might, you know, reach up to kind of scratch my chin and suddenly I'll noticing that my analysand is at the same moment reaching up to touch their chin, that this feeling of absolute attunement has started to kind of thrum in the room. And then there's that acknowledgement that the two unconscious minds have kind of linked in together and they're curious about each other. I would also add enactment to that, Mm -hmm. that uh, something happens that's actually uh, acted out. You know, for example, uh, literally bumping into one another. You know, I'm kind of making this up, but the client comes in the door and the analyst is opening the door and somehow both people step to the right or step to the left and and kind of bump into one another. But something physical can occur or an emotional interaction, uh, something that is atypical. Mm -hmm. That gives you kind of a flag. Yeah. Yeah. If we just uh, keep riffing on the alchemical images, in the next series in, in the images, that the alchemical king and queen are still interacting through this right and left hand connection but they are both naked. And so in terms of this process of falling in love with the analyst, there is this feeling of undefended revelation that often happens in the analysis and and sometimes on both sides that the analysand will feel suddenly comfortable with telling secrets that maybe they've never told anyone else before. And that if the analyst is tracking this properly, that the analyst will also be able to respond in a deeply undefended and authentic way to what's happening in the session, and that the artifices of social communication begin to fall away, and there's a level of directness and honesty and uh, rapport that begins to happen in the analysis, which again begins to foster this feeling of deep, deep intimacy. Yeah. And I think when you're at that level, it's like then that hour of the week is the hour of the week that's in technicolor. It feels really alive. And and there's, you know, as the woodcuts show us, the next woodcut, of course, is they're in the bath together. So there is a way that this is a deeply mutual process. And that's something I think that, at least in the beginning, analysands are surprised by that they're analysts, that we are deeply affected 
by the feelings and the images and the discussions that we have with our analysands, that not only in the session uh, does it evoke strong feelings, but even after the session, we'll find ourselves thinking about our analysands, reflecting on what they said or reflecting on some of their dream images in a way that, for myself, I can have very strong feelings. Uh, I'm in this stage, in the alchemical bath, so to speak, it's not uncommon for a client to tell me something which will bring tears to my eyes because I'm so affected and so in tune to what they're experiencing. And that does seem very much to be a part particularly of the first stage of analysis, is that both people do have to fall in love with one another a bit. We do have to get entrained. The analysand does have to feel received and understood and seen, fully seen in the eyes of another. And that doesn't happen unless there's genuine empathy, deep empathy, um, that attunement to the other person's unconscious that you mentioned, Lisa, uh, a, a fully felt relational container which is uh, fenced in. It is bounded by time limits and by financial payment, et cetera, so that those feelings can be contained f for the benefit of the analysis. Yes. And, and in the image of the alchemical bath, there is a dove that is descending between the two of the people mm. that neither person loses sight of the fact that this is sanctified space. And when something is sanctified or consecrated, even ritualistically, you know, the consecration of something in the church, it means that the object is going to be used for a certain purpose exclusively, and it's not going to be used for secular reasons. So by the alchemical bath being consecrated by the image of the dove, that there is an explicit clarity that anything, any feeling, any image, any dream, any confession is welcomed into the consulting room because whatever happens, it will only lead to conversation. And so it's sanctified to that level. And consequently, it is safe. Yeah, it's it's enclosed in in the kind of alchemical vase of of the work. So therefore, it's 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 both you know intensely felt, but it's also in this place where it's uh, it can be examined and explored and contained and contained in terms of not leading to actions. Yes. I wanted to bring up maybe some of, I mean, Joseph, you're leaning into one of the pitfalls that can happen when this arises in the work, uh, which is, you know, you haven't come out and said it, but but one possible way that this can be collapsed is to be enacted, right? I mean, it, you know, God forbid the analysand falls in love with the analyst and the analyst reciprocates by, you know, taking the client on as a lover. Stranger things have happened. But of course, this uh, is not considered ethical. You know, it certainly collapses the uh, container, doesn't it? And it then, you know, the the valuable contents of that container sort of leak out and into the world, and are no longer available for scrutiny and for deep understanding because they're just they're being enacted. Yes, that the, the alchemical process of transformation is uh, frankly just thwarted once the alchemical vase or the container has been violated. And then all kinds of problems uh, absolutely result from that. But in order for this to be a transformative process, the, the arising of passions is essential because that becomes the heat for the alchemical bath. So if we think about uh, that image of the king and the queen with the dove above them and descending into the alchemical bath, the alchemical bath becomes hot, becomes hot enough to begin softening something that is normally rigid in the personality. Well, it's like things are cooking, you know? 
that's the that's often the feeling of it is things are cooking well but think about also the <laughs> that any of us being in love at any other time in our life outside of the uh, analytic environment uh, i can remember times where i was ardently in love uh with somebody that i had been dating and uh, i would make all kinds of outlandish self-disclosures and uh, fantasy material would would sweep forward in great grand romantic gestures that uh, were kind of humiliating, you know, to my ego. <laughs> that you know, I had a very rigid perception of myself, and then I was kind of like a, a babbling monkey, you know, in the middle <laughs> of all of this ardor and passion. That the boundaries around who I thought I was or who I wanted to present myself as became very hot and malleable. Now, when that when that same passion begins to rise up in the analytic session, and it's held a sacred space, all of that heat, first of all, brings up a whole other level of secrets in the psyche, which uh, the person's often not even aware of. But it also begins to make the client malleable. Well, in a way, it's such a big return of feeling of that we all learn to limit ourselves, to keep our feelings to ourselves, to defend against feeling. And, you know, your uh, story about being in love and so on, our boundaries dissolve, they melt. I can tell this person anything, I can fall into his or her arms. There is a fluidity that I think, and the image of the bath brings that up, of things slosh, things are... <laughs> right? We wash away our defenses, our dirt, our stuff. It's um, There's idealization, and it's a wonderful return to an, an open, undefended, hopeful state uh, that in analysis is compensated for by very good, time-bounded, ethical kinds of boundaries as well uh, in, in, in analysis, so, so that that fluidity can occur and things can cook, uh, and we can have access to those feelings that are so enlivening. They can be agonizing as well of just, I can't wait for this hour to come about in my week. You know, I, I feel seen and heard, and it's exciting, and it's a real enlivenment uh, in a profound way for the person. And in the next alchemical image, uh, there is the actual conunctio, which is an image of copulation. Now, I know to our listeners, this might seem you know, particularly provocative, this idea of that image emerging as, a, as an analytic, symbolic analog. But it's important for us to understand that the conunctio, or the copulation, is an ancient image that shows up in Hindu temples of Shiva and Shakti, and this most intimate way of two bodies conjoining. And that when we take that as a psychological analog, it also brings us to a sensitivity about the incredible intimacy in the analysis and the way in which ideas seed back and forth between the analysand and the analyst. In some ways, this conjunctio phase of the analysis allows the interpretations that are offered by the analyst to take root in the deepest level of the analysis psyche and begins to encourage the image of the new and authentic self inside of the analysis to begin to gestate. I want to give a little context for this, I think because uh, there's kind of a question that, that I'm imagining some people may be asking themselves, which is, does this sort of always happen? Is, can you have a successful treatment without this? And what I'm remembering is uh, somewhere, Freud talked about the importance of transference, and Jung and Freud, when they were collaborating, spoke about it. And at one point, I think Freud asked Jung, well, what about the transference? And Jung said, it is the alpha and the omega. So there is a sense, on the one hand, that, that this kind of experience in, in analysis is 
you know, kind of critical for its success that there be these really strong feelings, uh, whether they're explicitly erotic or, or just very, very strong feelings. But in another place, Jung said, you know, sometimes the transference can be just sort of a distraction and that it isn't necessary for real work to happen. And, and I will say that that is my experience also. There are, there are kinds of treatments that have this quality of kind of emotional depth and this sense that we're really in some kind of uh, heated process together. And then there are other treatments that I think are also very successful where uh, there's something else in the room. It's it's still something good, but it's just not this. I don't know that I have other words for it right now, but it just feels a little, it's just a little dried out, not in a bad way, uh, but it just doesn't have this, the kind of moisture of these these other kind of situations. Is that, would, what do you guys think about that? I agree with you, Lisa. I'm trying to think of uh, what do I think makes the difference. And my thought is that when there's been a relational, chronic relational early trauma or substantial deficits, that the person may bring that need into analysis more strongly than someone who comes in with maybe a, a stronger early foundation or who simply wants and is looking for something different from the process. Uh, uh, an adjustment in, uh, let's say, you know, in midlife. And that may be where the difficulty is uh, without needing to go back to some of these more uh, primal kinds of connections with the analyst. How I would clarify that is that not all analysis leads to transformation, or at least not transformation in the way that Jung was talking about it in the Rosarium. That People come to restore sometimes something that's amiss in the ego structure. People may come to work out a piece of trauma. People may come to simply, or not so simply, to restore the relationship of the ego to the self. And then any further transformation is going to be overseen by that relationship to the self. And the analyst may never hear about it years later on. So I, I agree with you that there are absolutely different reasons and different outcomes that bring people to an analytic encounter. But I do think that if the analyst is involved in the arc of transformation, that some form of this idea of the conjunctio, this blending at this deep level, does need to happen in order for the sometimes they call it the rebus or the final mysterious new personality that's latent in the psyche to emerge. And it does not always have to show up as erotic imagery. For instance, I think of an analysis um, that was very, very deep. This was a, uh, a heterosexual male and at a certain point in the analysis had a vision. And in this vision, he had become this ethereal soul-like being and that in the imagination, I had met them in that space, and I had exhaled into their mouth, and something had passed into them that changed them. Now, that's a different kind of, that's a different way of imagining the conjunctio, or the conjoining, that served the purpose of of this melding of personality in a way that that psyche found very, very useful, and at the same way, deeply, deeply intimate. You know, I think one of the things that we're kind of walking around is that when this feeling of in love with your analyst comes up, that's sort of the, the psyche's way of imaging a desire for this conjunctio experience. You know, so, you know, if it, if you find yourself, you know, kind of having a, an explicitly erotic fantasy about your analyst, that this is how we would understand that. I'm thinking uh, very kind of concretely about how we start out in life developmentally, and we have to be related to another. You know, we grow inside another. And when we're infants, we are totally dependent on another. 
And we're wired to get what we need from another human being. But in your story, Joseph, about uh, the image of you breathing into the other person's mouth, what we want and what may have happened for that person was the connection with himself or herself was achieved in a different way. And that really is the uh, wished for, hoped for outcome of analysis is that the relationship with oneself, with one's inner other, can take place through a relationship with an outer other. And for some people, I think it may um, be sort of like those images in the rosarium of the left-handed contact and sitting in the bath. For others, it may take place um, more subtly through a different kind of connection. So I'm thinking about the, once again, this passionate stage in the analysis where eros or love dominates the energetic field, and that leads to the emergence of of, uh, primal images and passion and instincts and the beginning of a transformation, both for the analyst and the analysand. And I wanted to to just conclude, in a sense, by looking at the next stage in the alchemical images, which is the uh, mortificatio. And what that means is, if the passionate energy, if the landing of love has been successful, ironically, that that's followed by a release of that tension and a period of what can feel like a deadness in the analytic work. That once the seeding of the new idea and the dissolution of boundaries has been successful, the analysis can become very, very quiet, that our passions can seemingly overnight just disappear but something very mysterious and profound is happening in the most subterranean levels of the psyche, which, if they're tended patiently, are still on track to lead to a transformation. You know, I think that's a, a great point uh, and, a, and a good image to bring in at this time, because in, in some way, I think what you're saying is once you've had this kind of ecstatic experience of union, what follows can feel sort of ordinary and dry. And uh, I wanted to lift up another way in which things can go wrong when this happens in an analysis. Uh, well, maybe two other ways. And, and maybe look also at how this gets resolved, because because in essence, it's a very, as we've been saying, it's a very valuable thing to have happen. But then you have to tend to it the right way to make sure that it, it is in the interest of healing. So the first thing I want to mention is that it is important for the analyst to be able to take on the projection of the love object in a way. In other words, you, you have to subtly sense that this is what the person needs and then you have to let yourself be that to a point. So uh, if this kind of energy is rising up in the work, let's say, and, the, and it makes the analyst uncomfortable, and so the analyst defends against it. You know, for example, if I had gotten freaked out or affronted or something when, when my client spoke to me about that and I had sort of rejected it or, or said, well, we don't do that here or something like that, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have received the projection that he had on me as a sort of a love object. And there would have been an opportunity for healing missed. On the other hand, I think the other thing that can happen is this kind of thing can make the analyst very anxious and the analyst can can sort of downplay it so that it simmers in the background and never really gets addressed. You know, that it's, yeah, that it's defended against. And then another thing that can happen also is that an analyst may enjoy receiving this projection. I mean, it feels pretty damn good. And he or she may not help the person resolve the the transference projection. So the idea is that in some very subtle way, the analyst has a sense when it's time for the person to kind of take back the projection 
and live that out in their own life. So at some point, you have to help the person very gently kind of puncture this uh, inflated view that they have of you, help them to see you as a real person, help give them back this kind of wondrous, magical thing that they have experienced as belonging to you. And you have to help them see that it's really theirs. Not so easy to do, but I've, I've seen it happen more than once that, you know, someone has come into my practice with a very unresolved transferential feeling about a former uh, analyst. And it, it is difficult work to help them reclaim uh, their soul that in a way they had projected on the analyst. Do you think that that's something that the analyst crafts at a conscious level or is it the natural evolution of the process if it's just held correctly by the analyst? Well, I mean, obviously it's kind of an organic process, right? But I do think that as an analyst, we are aware of which way things are tending. And when we see that the person may need to have us on a pedestal, for example, that we let that happen. And then when we see that they need that less, that we would very gently kind of help them out in that direction and and kind of you know at the at just the right moment sort of step down from the pedestal or show ourselves to be a little more human or something like that. So I think there there should be some some conscious awareness of on the analyst part and I'm saying that just partly because I I do know of these cases where the analyst didn't do that and and in a way kept on participating in a way where they continued to draw that projection and it left the person feeling very stuck. I also think to go back to your um, referencing the unconscious to unconscious connection, that a lot of this resides there and that hopefully the analyst has, through his or her own years of analysis, become sufficiently acquainted with his or her unconscious, that that fuel for the analysis projection is really not there, that it's in the analyst's awareness that this is a projection. And uh, therefore, the analyst doesn't take it on, doesn't start to believe uh, those kinds of things. And, and sometimes just a comment like, you know, my goodness, um, you really have put me on a pedestal here, or, oh my goodness, uh, you know, I, I really occupy a very special place, a very magical place in your heart. Something like that uh, may serve to just highlight that this is what your process is. I hear it. I understand that that's, or I'm trying to understand that this is uh, how you may feel in the moment. But just by saying it, it also calls up the other side, which is, and of course, I'm a flesh and blood human being. I can't possibly be that idealized. But I, I'm thinking too, Joseph, of what you said, that I think uh, holding it and holding it in consciousness eventually does pave the way for the person to, as we say, take back the projection of what he or she needed to see in the analyst or in me of the realization that uh, this belongs to the analysand and and has had that person has had a safe experience of loving uh, freely without it being defended against or criticized or rejected or or any of that stuff or taken advantage of oh yes you know and i'm not even just talking about acting it out but taking advantage of it in again that way that it feels really good to have divinity projected on you but there is a time to let that go. I'm drinking all of that in. Well, I'm appreciating that every erotic transference requires something different because every person is different. And there's an enormous amount of timing and nuance and also evaluation about how successful or unsuccessful the transformative process might be proceeding. Some experiments in the alchemical laboratory have to be halted 
because what's being created is not helpful or even toxic. So not every alchemical operation is guaranteed. And, and we have to move forward in, in the best way that we know how. I do feel like, in my own experience, that if the erotic transference is held by the analyst and neither inflamed nor punctured, that the frustration in the client, in the analysand, reaches a kind of maximal tension that then causes a certain kind of psychological flip to happen inside of them that begins to move them from the idealization often into a lot of um, angry frustration because it isn't being actualized. And it's in that transition into the kind of optimal frustration that images of the transformation can begin to emerge. I think the difficulty in that I've observed is encouraging people to stay in the analysis when their love transitions into frustration and to believe that this is a purposive process, even though it's uh, uncomfortable or perhaps even really deeply humbling for the individual. I'm wary about the puncturing of any projection on, on uh, two too conscious a level. I think it's really, really tricky to know from an ego level exactly the right time to do that. I find if somebody it brings forward a projection that is, too, that is really, really hot, that if I meet that with a kind of uh, unflappable, non-reactive calmness, that that also gives information back into the system in terms of inviting, without being too heavy-handed, the possibility that the person could become aware that they are uniquely generating this fantasy. I also want to say on, a, on the far end of the other spectrum, I remember reading Nathan Schwartzelant's book on treating borderline disorders. And he accounts in the book, if I'm remembering correctly, these um, very intense sessions he would have with some clients where the client would imagine in the session the erotic encounter and uh, Nathan as the analyst would enter into this almost as a kind of psychodrama also passionately participating in the fantasy in the room allowing the frustration to reach a kind of maximal level but keeping the fantasy in this exclusively imaginal realm, but that he would co-participate in that imaginal work very overtly, and that that uh, produced tremendous resolutions, positive resolutions in the, uh, in the analysis. Now, in a, in a more gentle way, I've also heard analysts say that when an analysand professes their romantic love, and perhaps a fantasy that they would run off together, the analyst might say, well, let's imagine that together. Let's, let's imagine what it would be like. Where, where would we run off? And then how would that happen? And then what would that be like for you? And what do you imagine that would be like for me? And allowing the unconscious to, to manifest in the analytic container, in the room, in this kind of dreamy quality, which can allow some of that frustration to be captured in the fantasy. And Jung suggested this very explicitly in his writing, that when the unconscious drive finally verbalizes or makes manifest its fantasy, the fantasy that it hopes would meet its needs, it creates a kind of closed circuit, which he called an uroboric circuit, and that the energy would then begin to move discreetly inside of the analysand's psyche, and that would fuel another and deeper level of change, positive change in the psyche. Yeah, I think the um, allowing the fantasy uh, to be spoken and to be explored is part of the, you know, accepting a projection and the very strong feeling behind it of that the two of us would run off together to 
you know, uh, some Caribbean island or something. Of It's part of that unflappable acceptance that this part of you is okay. It can be spoken. And we can engage it symbolically. This is a conversation, after all. It's, it's not a love affair. And for the analyst sometimes to risk expressing what that fantasy constellates inside of their own psyche. And that's very powerful. Does it constellate anxiety in me? Or is it, is it also pleasing inside of me? Or is it deeply unattractive? But that that ingredient of what it constellates in the analyst is also part of the medicine in the alchemical vessel. And that can feel very risky to bring that level of humanity and response into the moment. Yeah, this is, this is obviously a very hot topic, isn't it? It is. And I feel like this conversation could really go on for an entire week-long conference <laughs> because it is so profound and yeah. so complicated. I, I would also, though, like to add that it can also be very tender, uh, very real, Yes. Very, very poignant, and that there are all kinds of love other than sort of erotic love that enter the consulting room. And uh, we, we do need to make room for it. It's part of our humanity. It's not always that, you know, we're talking about it as if it's, you know, somehow, uh, you know, nuclear energy. It, it can be that. Usually it's very human, very warm, and touching to both people. And part of what we do in our work, and hopefully um, loving each other in various ways uh, in our lives, and restoring a connection to the analysis. And uh, it's a hell, it should be, we want it to be a healthy human process. So, one of the things that I, I hope we can leave with the listener is how seriously, as analysts, we take the emergence of love in the analysis. That when, when you come, or if you ever come to the analyst and confess this passion in your heart, that it will be taken seriously, that it will be held as part of the journey of the soul, and that it is often a tremendously important part of the process of transformation. And hopefully you can trust your analyst to meet you in just the right way. Yeah, that's just lovely. That's perfect. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work. But producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. So we have a 20-year-old dreamer who is currently a student. And we should say he's male. And here's the dream. I was some kid with a family. The family left me out of some event, and then they went on a hot air balloon trip without me. After returning, when I complain, the mother announces that I'm ready for it and prepares to have intercourse with me. But just then, her upper body turns into a giant snake and moved to devour me, and that woke me up. 
Some context in the dream. He says, I had just taken on huge responsibilities and work to make my life more meaningful. During the dream, he felt isolation, irritation, and fear. And then he offers a bit more explanation that the kid was not me from my childhood, and neither was the family my own. They were all different people who I had actually never seen. So I would certainly call this to start off an archetypal dream. Yes. <laughs> oh <my laughs> that <goodness>. These extraordinary <laughs> mythic elements are kind yes. of showing up uh, in the dreamer psyche, and that has a lot of power in it. Well, it's interesting because the first part of the dream, it's a short dream, the first two sentences, I'm a kid with a family, the family left me out of an event, and they went on a hot air balloon trip without me. That's not particularly archetypal, right? <laughs> but then they return and I complain, and that's when uh, the archetypes really show up, don't they? So uh, it's interesting that we were just talking about the the incendiary emergence of eros and sex and love in the autolytic container. And now we have uh, the most taboo example of sexuality showing up, which is the incest fear. And this is something that both Jung and Freud were very interested in. And for Jung, he felt that this fear of sibling incest was uh, powerful inside of the psyche, and that for Freud, this mother-son incestual anxiety was the most powerful. But all of it speaks to a dimension of sexual energy that is so overwhelming and so primal that it violates all the senses of rules and regulations in the civilized culture and can create an enormous amount of anxiety in the psyche of the individual. And, and actually, um, in volume five, Symbols of Transformation, there's a way in which that whole book really revolves around uh, this idea of mother-son incest. And this was a, a really important book in, in terms of Jung's life because writing it, he knew it would result in a break with Freud because of how he interpreted um, incest and sexual sexuality and, and sexual energy. And one of the things, I mean, I'm going to sort of grossly oversimplify this, but essentially he thought that mother-son incest was an, an image of a, re, of a desired return to the unconscious. So that the mother as a symbol represents the unconscious, the matrix out of which consciousness is born. And so for consciousness, the dream ego, to have sex with the mother would be an image of a return to the the unconscious. So I, I think I've probably shared this joke on the podcast before, and I I, I love it, and I don't promise I won't share it again. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that for Freudians, religion is really about sex. For Jungians, sex is really about religion. So there there is a way that we can tend to do that. We sort of mythologize or make sex symbolic. And and often I think it is. Sometimes maybe we do it a little bit defensively. But but here my guess is that that's what's going on that this is truly a a symbolic image along the lines of which Jung wrote in what was that? I think 1912. I can't remember right now. In any case, a long time ago. So let's let's um using it that way you know, what are some of the symptoms of being devoured by the mother? I'm thinking about uh, Jung imaging uh, separation from the mother in a young man as the fight with the dragon. Snakes and dragons are, you know, kind of more or less variations on the same theme. And uh, that this is, in my view, you know, very, I would want to explore with the dreamer the separation from his mother and and what that is costing of the giant snake and she's going to devour him prior to that she was going to penetrate him and have intercourse with him of that something in the, he's fighting for uh, the development which is very age appropriate at age 20 
of developing a strong, flexible, well-adapted ego. And that is absolutely the task of life uh, right at this stage of development versus being seduced and terrified both (laughs) back into a, a more unconscious kind of state, a younger state. A sort of clinging, it could potentially be an image of a wish to cling to childhood. Mm-hmm. Exactly, of of leaving that Euroboric field, the circular field, which is imaged by a snake uh, eating its own tail. So to, to land that in a lived experience, he says he's just taken on huge responsibilities at work to make the life more meaningful. So to be swallowed by the mother might be to feel that I just can't cope with all those responsibilities, that I have to hand those decisions over to someone else or to an authority figure, that I'm going to do lower levels of work because I can't take or won't tolerate the uncertainty or the strain of managing all these uh, significant outcomes. Another way of being devoured by the mother could be falling into a depression. Or another psychiatric issue. Like what? Give some hard examples so people can understand. Yeah, I mean, I think that being swallowed by the snake or, or kind of regressing to the mother, that can look like psychosis too. In the worst case. If, and yes. so in that way that people might be lost in these intrusive fantasies or even delusions, people could become paranoid about something that isn't real or believe something perhaps even outrageous, which isn't quite true. Yes. And of, and of course, just to clarify, you know, we are in no way attempting to uh, diagnose this dreamer. We're just pinging off the imagery. Now, he says the main feeling in the dream is isolation, irritation, and fear. So sometimes when we're swallowed by the mother, every little thing irritates us and we expect the environment to accommodate us almost the way a baby wants to be put in a soft environment and kept away from all loud noises. So we can wind up in a kind of princess and the pea condition where every little thing just seems intolerably uh, intrusive or upsetting to us. Another manifestation, as he notes, is this idea of fear, that when we're in the mother, we feel small and young and everything else feels big and dangerous and threatening. And that makes us feel frightened and then consequently perhaps inappropriately defensive. I, I want to go back to the first part of the dream. We got uh, <laughs> understandably uh, interested in all these archetypal images. And I think the beginning is supporting our kind of deconstruction of the archetypal images of I was a kid with a family. So uh, there's the situation as it is of feeling young and uh, one person with older people and uh, more and more than one. And then they go up in a hot air balloon trip without me, not a train trip, you know, not a hiking trip, but a hot air balloon. And that is such a vivid image of a kind of inflation and ungroundedness up in the air. And so there he is in a way alone again, uh, they've gone wafting up into the wild blue yonder, and he's kind of stuck there on the ground by himself. And that may be in a lot of ways, and we've already discussed the second part of the dream, of, of that sense of I'm on my own, and it may feel big, and I may feel left out of the hot air trip. And these other images of, of mother saying, you're ready for it, and turning into a snake are scary. Um, But there is a way in which it's also a test of of ego, of we do have to stand our ground. We do have to be alone. Uh, We do have to deal with these uh, challenges that are imaged in pretty archetypal terms here. Deb, that's good. And I'm going to sort of dig into that a little bit. I find it interesting that the, the mother sort of becomes this threatening figure. When I complain, the mother announces I'm ready for it. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, so so what I was thinking about that is that when he tries to stand his ground and sort of separate, the, the mother really kind of bites back, as it were. 
I also think it's interesting that he's some kid with a family and it's not him and it's not his family. And I wonder like, why would the psyche do that? And one thing that I come up with as a possibility is that somehow this issue feels pretty far away. It feels ego distant. Maybe it needs to be defended against. Maybe it's a little too threatening. But there's some There's some real distance here, right? Yes, there's a distance, and I thought about that in the uh, with the feelings that he reported having of isolation, irritation, and fear. Uh, but he doesn't say, I, "I was paralyzed with fear," or "You know, I was overwhelmed." And that's a good question as to whether this process has already is already underway, and he's worked through a good part of it or whether there's a defense against it. Well, I do notice that the last line is, and that woke me up. So maybe this dreamer is waking up. I think there's there's something, uh, there's a lot to say about the word complain. And there's something, there's a lot to say about what happens in a young man's psyche where he believes that that's the effective intervention to the problem. So let's say he's, I'm just fantasizing, he's there at work and he's up against something and that there's an array of ways of responding to a problem at work. Maybe someone's required to give him a report and they haven't filed it yet, or he has a, a coworker that's you know in the cubicle next door and they're being too loud, or any number of, of just obstructions or, or things we have to deal with. And in a young man, for the solution to rise up that I'm just going to complain about it is actually a particularly impotent um, response to life because it places, it takes all of the power or agency out of the individual and puts it outside of himself that this situation, the other person, the environment, should respond to my complaint, it overestimates the value of their own suffering. You see, when I'm complaining, the assumption is that my discomfort should be so important to you that just reporting my discomfort should mobilize the environment and that things should change in that regard. And all of that goes to this very young kind of psychology of expectation. So in the dream, he's kind of excluded from something that I'm imagining he thinks is a lot of fun, a lot of pleasure. And he wants the family to respond to that by voicing his disappointment. And they're supposed to come back with some resolution of his disappointment. And instead, the psyche responds by offering to devour him because he is returning to this kind of impotent childlike response to his disappointment. So what I would be interested in with this young man is working with him around the psychology of complaining, which by the way, could be its own podcast now that we're talking about it, the psychology of complaining. And are there any other images inside of him other than complaining that could be much more effective and give him a very different relationship to himself in the world. I'm uh, kind of in a slightly different position. I I do agree with what you said, Joseph, that when we complain, we expect the other to do something about it. We expect the environment to change or somebody to make us feel better. On the other hand, um, it's very human. We're entitled to it. It, it can be a legitimate protest of, hey, you know, all you guys went off on a really fun trip without me and I didn't like it and I'm mad or whatever it might be. Uh, so I don't see anything necessarily wrong with taking it to the interpersonal world first, especially because this dream uh, ends with, and that woke me up. The complaining didn't work. Things went from bad to worse. First, they went on the hot air balloon trip without him. Uh, then mother um, prepares to have intercourse and turns into a snake. Oh, good God. And that woke me up. So all of these things wind up putting him back in himself. 
Uh, and I think he meant it literally that he woke up from his sleeping state and the dream, but we could also take it as, you know, in a literal and uh, symbolic sense, consciousness dawned. And this is a quite young person. So in some ways, a lot of what we're talking about is really developmentally appropriate. And I'm wondering if that would be a good place to stop. I won't complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.